Okay, so. So back to the uh, introduction, uh, listing in Australia, the listing of um, Professor Jose Maria Sison and the CPP MPA in Australia was done in 2002 after a visit of uh, then Philippine Foreign Minister Blas Opley um, to Australia. And of course, uh, only months after the 9-11 uh, uh, incidents, uh, attacks in, in the USA, um, the essentially um, the listing is made under the U UN and the United Nations Security um, Council resolution 1373, um, the designation or the instrument designating a person or an entity as a terrorist organization is made under regulation seven of Australia's Charter of the United Nations anti-terrorism regulations introduced in 2001. Um, and essentially within that uh, regulation, sub regulation 7.1 obliges a person holding the position of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, a minister to list a person or entity for counter-terrorism financial sanctions sanctions if the minister is satisfied that they are a person or entity mentioned in paragraph 1c of uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 3073. The determination made by the Minister for Foreign Affairs in his per personal capacity uh, is that a person or organisation is a person who commits, attempts to commit or participates in or facilitates the commission of terrorist acts, an entity owned or controlled by such persons or a person or entity acting on behalf or at the direction of such persons and entities. The mechanism is what's called a gazettal, so a publication in an, an official government publication. Um, and, and essentially, if the minister is satisfied that the person is such a person, then uh, there is a publication in uh, the Gazette, the Government Gazette, and a person so listed as a prescribed person or entity for these regulations. And the Minister may also list assets or classes of assets that the Minister uh, is satisfied are owned or controlled by a person or entity mentioned in paragraph 1C of the resolution. The paragraph 1C of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 3373 is a source of power. Um, Australia has um, passed legislation adopting uh, the UN res uh, uh, resolutions um, and essentially the resolution, according to the Australian government, requires states to freeze without delay funds and other financial assets or economic resources of persons who commit or attempt to commit terrorist acts or participate in or facilitate the commission of terrorist acts of entities owned or controlled directly or indirectly by such persons and other persons or and entities acting on behalf of or at the direction of such persons and entities, including funds derived or generated from property owned or controlled directly or indirectly by such persons and associated persons and entities. So essentially, uh, that is um, the legislative basis. Um, I might um, throw to Jason first um, for uh, his uh, input and then ask Ray V to talk about the legal practicalities um, uh, based on his writings. So, okay. Thank you, Jason, Steve. if you can. Okay, sure. I didn't really prepare anything uh, written or anything uh, formal. I thought uh, the, the meeting would be some sort of like sharing of notes. Uh, so, so Everything I know about John Mason's case, Jan Fremont knows much better. Uh, so, so what what I will do actually is to sort of give certain like commentary on 
you know, my observations about the case. Uh, and also I should say in the beginning that I no longer practice, I've not been practicing for years now. So I'm more, I'm more of a, uh, like a scholar of the politics of the law rather than a legal scholar. So anyway, so my first, uh, um, the first point I want to say is that with respect to the, uh, uh, the freezing of assets. Now, we, this listing is supposed to be about the freezing of assets, the theories, right? And uh, so the first thing to note is Joma hardly has any assets, right? And uh, he doesn't, I don't know if he has assets in his name or which he controls directly or indirectly in Australia, right? And therefore, the freezing of his assets is not really something that has any practical significance for either Joma or for Australia, right? So the real meaning of uh, the listing of Joma by DFAT is not really to freeze his assets, but really to vilify him as a terrorist. So it's the political consequence that's more important than the stated uh, legal or yeah, practical consequence no, as stated in the uh the the regulations governing the the freezing of uh, his assets or his his terrorist listing so that's the first point that i want to make the second point is uh that under because australia says we're we've decided the joma season or at least defat says we've decided the joma season should be listed uh, under resolution 1373 or rather his listing uh, is pursuant to the UN uh, what was what they call it the Charter of the United Nations Act which is an Australian law which merely implements uh, decisions of the of the UN Security Council uh, so there's some sort of like uh, uh confusion there because so, so some people think uh joma season was done by the un security council right uh i think even Raby makes that 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 sort of mistake in his memo uh so the un security council did not list any uh did not list this on no? in, in any of its sanctions list no so the UN Security uh, Council, for example, maintains a list of terrorists associated with Al Qaeda and ISIS. CSON uh, is not in that list, and also Resolution 1373 does not contain a list. So it's even inaccurate to say the list was made under 1373. There was no list under 1373. It merely says uh, states shall freeze the assets of persons who are involved in terrorism. So the listing was actually done by individual states. So the listing of CSON is a political act, a political decision of the authorities in each state. So even the EU uh, case of CSON, the court said the listing of a terrorist involves a discretionary act. No? And many uh, commentators have already said, essentially this act is a political act. It involves a political judgment. No? It's, it, it's nothing, there's, not, there's no objective test. No? Uh, so some people are clearly terrorists, but they're not listed because some states object to their listing. Or some people who commit much more serious acts are not listed, whereas people who commit less serious acts are listed, right? Because all of these judge, all of these decisions involve, you know, political judgment. Okay, so, so in that case, the listing of season we could clearly say is a political judgment of DFAT of the Australian DFAT. So the next question is. Is, is this judgment governed by any, you know, legal uh, test? Huh? Is, is, is there, a, in other words, any legal constraint on this judgment? So uh, Peter has already said that 
uh, the it seems that there there's very little constraint on this judgment because apparently the listing is governed by uh, that section of the the uh, the UN Charter Act that Peter cited, which in turn refers to uh, the the uh, rest. Uh, a test that is provided in the resolution of the Security Council and the relevant resolution is 1373. And that test simply says that the person need only, hey, Peter, can you, can you share your screen again? Yeah, I can, I'll do that. Yeah. I clicked on the wrong button. Is this the page you wanted? Uh, no, the one before that, the one before that. Yeah, okay. Can you make it larger? I think it's slide number three, is it? Slide number three. This one? The third slide, slide number three in your uh, slide deck. This one is number five. Okay. On the left, you can see the number, Peter. Okay, slide three. Yeah, that one, yeah, that one. A person who commits, attempts to commit or participates in or facilitates the commission of terrorist acts. Okay, well, Joma is not an entity, so we can skip that, the second one. Or a person or entity acting on behalf of or other direction of such persons and entities. So apparently this is the only sort of like constraint yeah, so on the, the judgment no, of uh, the, minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So if you list a person who does not commit, who does not attempt to commit, who does not participate or facilitate the commission of a terrorist act, or a person who is not acting on behalf of or a direction of, uh, you know, of such person or entities, then clearly, the minister would be doing an illegal thing, right? So this is sort of like the constraint, the legal constraint on his judgment. Okay, so okay, thanks, Peter. So I look back to the EU case, the EU delisting case where season was successful. And in that EU case, this, the court did use also, you know, a sort of like did look at the legal constraint uh for for listing and uh maybe i'll share my screen then <clears throat> this time uh you have to are you a host now co-host maybe peter you have to make him co-host no i think i can share my screen right i'll just allow him to share um but i can also make him a co-host yeah make him a co-host Sorry, it's taking a long time. Let me see. No, it still doesn't work. Sorry, it doesn't work. Doing. You cannot share. Oh, wait, there's something here. Hmm. Anyway, I'll just read it out then. Uh, so in the EU case, the court 
referred to the EU regulation that governs the designation procedure, namely Common Position 2001-931. And in paragraph 1-4 of that uh, regulation, it says the list in the annex shall be drawn up on the basis of precise information or material in the relevant file, which indicates that a decision has been taken by a competent authority in respect of the persons, groups, and entities concerned, irrespective of whether it concerns the instigation of investigations or prosecution for a terrorist act an attempt to perpetrate, participate in, or facilitate such an act based on serious and credible evidence or clues or condemnation for such deeds. Sorry, that's a mouthful, no? Several lines, no? Uh, <clears throat> so the court interpreted this uh, provision to mean that the listing you know, consists of sort of two stages, no? So there has to first to be a national authority. It's usually a court, but it can be a prosecutor uh, that decides that an individual should be investigated or prosecuted based on serious and credible evidence for a terrorism related offense. And secondly, then the council decides that that individual should be included in the list on the basis of the fact that a national authority has taken the decision in the first stage. Okay. So I, I look back to the, uh, to the query of Joma and he asked whether, you know, in Australia, and this now addressed to Rabi and Peter, in Australia, can we read you know, what 1373 says uh, to mean that there must first be a national authority, you know, uh, instigating some kind of prosecution, yeah, uh, if uh, uh, for some serious crime, no? some. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for some terrorism related offense based on some serious crime no? uh, before that person can be listed by DFAT. No? So in other words, uh, is, there some, is there any similarity you know, between the legal restraints that, the, that, that we have in Australia and the legal restraints that the EU, uh, you know, the EU, uh, that they exist in the EU, you know, according to the EU court. You know? uh, I think that, that that's an important question because as Joma observed, the, minist the Minister of uh, Home Affairs did not include Joma, right? But the, the, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs did include Joma. So does this indicate that the evidence, if there is any, uh, does not point to any uh, connection between Joma uh, and any particular terrorist act, no? Because if they do have evidence, how come he's not listed by the Minister of Home Affairs, right? So, but if there is evidence, no, uh, then we can we we can query whether the evidence, no, is about Joma's involvement in. In, in terrorism and if whether the evidence is serious serious enough. You know? uh, so looking back to the EU case again, the court also said, you no, know, because in the EU what happened was that in the course of uh, this case, you know, yeah, uh, so in, initially Joma said, there is not even a single case you know, anywhere in the world you know, against Joma. You know? Uh, not in the Philippines, no, not in Europe, not anywhere, no, and that provoked uh, the Philippine government as well as the Dutch government to start filing cases against Joma, right? So Joma was actually arrested, no, in the course of uh, his case, he was arrested, he was detained, no, and they tried to 
to build a case for murder no? against Joma. And then the court had a chance to look at the evidence, no? uh, whether the evidence was serious enough and whether the evidence connected Joma to any specific act of terrorism. And the court said, actually not. No? So the court said, what the evidence shows is some you know, general connection no? between Joma and uh, the CPP and PA you know, and other supposed terrorists with whom he might have associated while in Europe. And the court said, that's not enough. No? That, is, that, that is not evidence of any connection between Joma and specific acts of terrorism or specific acts of planning terrorism, right? So, so, so those, so, 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 so those things. No? So, so this address now to Peter and Raby because you know because I'm not an Australian lawyer. No, I don't know the Australian law. So maybe, is there anything in you know sort of the legal constraints to this political decision by the DFAT, the. Uh, uh, which sort of uh, you know has to do with you know what kind of evidence needs to be there uh, for Joma to be listed because in the EU apparently there is that no? there is that element. No? So maybe I should stop here and uh, let Ray be talk now. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Ray. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. That was a very very succinct um, summary of uh, you know um, Joma's uh, case in the EU. Um, I was just actually re reviewing the the um, Charter of the United Nations Act 1945, which Australia uh, actually enacted in 1945. <laughs> um, my my feeling is you know whatever the the UN Security Council you know enacts or pass, I think Australia would just rubber stamp it without the minister even looking at the, you know, this, um, you know, this consolidated list or whatever it is. And as you, Jason said, you know, Joma is not even in that, but why, why was he, he listed, you know, in the, um, you know, in this charter of the United Nations Act and sanction? It's a very interesting, and I think it's very political. Um, in that way, and um, there is a well. It went into the court, you know, in in the um, in the EU. But in here, I, I think it's it's a good way of testing, um, you know, this uh, legislation. And actually, there is a provision in the Act, um, Section Seventeen, um, where the listed person may actually apply to have the delisting revoked. So um, there is a provision there, you know, to um, um, as a process, as, as an administrative process, requesting uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, you know, to actually revoke or, or remove Joma, you know, from from the listing. So there is a provision there. Um, but when you actually go to the DFAT website. It actually makes you more confused because <laughs> when you click the um, you know the delisting uh, button, it actually um, points you to the um, the, the United Nations uh, sanctions uh, regime. It's called Focus something, um, which is really confusing. Um, it's it's my feeling that you know they they try to make you know the you know this this whole regime process uh, confusing for the people who you know who would like to um, apply for um, the revocation or the delisting of of their names. Um, but yes, yeah, so well the provision is there. Um, Joma can actually apply in writing and 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 list the reasons on why you know he's. Um, his name or himself, you know, wanted to be um, um, actually delisted. Um, so um, it, it's a good way to, to test that and election is coming up. So um, um, that, that's one way, you know, to, um, to do that, I guess, on a practical level. 
maybe Peter, you can say something more about the, the process. I'm a constitutional <laughs> expert, so I'm an admin too. I'm, I'm just dabbling here. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> well, I'd say um, what I'd say is um, the it's a political decision. Um, as both um, Jason and Ravi have said, was a political decision made at the instigation of um, the then Philippine government uh, in 2001, 2002. Um, Blas Alpley was a minister who visited Australia at the time, I remember that. Um, one of the things um, that... Uh, is also mentioned in um, the uh, memorandum which uh, DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, released um, when uh, the listing was renewed last time uh, was that um, the person may write to the minister requesting a statement of reasons uh, for the listing so that... Uh, when they want, when they then subsequently make an application to have the delisting revoked, they can address the reasons set out. Um, the problematic um, is that it's it's a declassified list, so that means that uh, information uh, can be withheld on a range of uh, grounds, essentially the sort of national security grounds. Uh, that we're all familiar with that uh, different governments uh, push and promote. <clears throat> However, it'll be interesting to see what is given. Um, Ray V um, uh, might be fami more familiar with um, uh, the um, implications for immigration uh, law in this area. Um, I guess two things that uh, I am aware of uh, from my practice, I'm practicing criminal law, um, and I often have clients who are uh, maybe permanent residents of Australia. Maybe they came to Australia at the age of two or three or even younger, um, lived here for 30 or 40 years, um, and then uh, spent, committed an offence which carries a, a term of at least two years in jail. Um, and even if they didn't go to jail, they can be removed from Australia um, and sent back primarily to New Zealand. Um, and a lot of our New Zealand colleague, uh, counterparts and comrades um, will know that um, uh, your Prime Minister is not very happy about this process. Um, but um, the process on what is done is... is, is pretty um, uh, pretty opaque. You really don't um, know a lot of the reasoning and often uh, you, I mean, I've had cases where essentially um, a letter is delivered to, to a person, possibly they don't even speak English as a first language and they've got um, 14 days or something ridiculous to respond to it, uh, to lay out the reasons why they shouldn't remove, be removed from the country. Um, so, and, and when it's a personal decision of the minister involved, in that case, the Minister for Immigration, this is a second aspect. So if it's a decision of a staff member of the department, a delegate, as they call it on the legislation, uh, then it can be taken to a tribunal um, for both merits and law uh, issues. So merits are... Um, the sort of um, discussions we've had about um, whether or not the evidence is sufficient, whether or not, um, you know, other considerations, the fact that uh, Joma has never been charged or prosec uh, successfully prosecuted for a terrorist-related uh, offence, um, arguably falls under that merit review. Um, and what uh, is only open to... Um, judicial challenge in a tribunal is whether or not the decision is so obviously wrong, uh, it can't be supported, it, can't, it has to be reviewed. So it's more about the decision making process rather than the content of the argument, um, which I think differs. Um, and Ray V, um, I think you've got more experience in, in, in that sort of area than, than I have. 
or at least in, in the immigration law area, because um, uh, it applies in, in other decisions. Um, and for instance, I think it also applies uh, when a member of a family um, who's applying, uh, has a visa or applies for a visa, uh, has some sort of uh, disability which has medical cost implications. The minister can uh, make a decision that the, uh, the visa uh, is either cancelled or refused and the people have to return. Um, and there have been some heart-rending cases. Um, but then, you know, the, the decision-making is pretty opaque. Um, so I, I guess those are the two steps. I mean, practically, I think uh, I would see two steps, uh, two processes. The first one is a letter signed by Joma asking for the Minister for Foreign Affairs to set out the reasons for the listing and the continued listing um, on the basis that once we receive that, we will dry, draft an application for the delisting. Um, Ravi, have you any comments on I think, that? I think Jan has got a question, he's raising his hand. Yes, Jan, what would you like to ask? No, actually, I didn't have a question. I have a, a few observations in yes. addition to what uh, Jason uh, said previously. But if you want me to make that later, it's OK. I can do it also yeah. a little bit later in the process. OK, we'll come to you and just hear from Ravi on the practicality. I think, I think the other corner has got a question about uh, is, is organizations like the CPP and NPA, um, would, would, the, would it follow the same criteria? The answer to that, the ICS, yes. uh, sorry, I didn't make that clear. The section 17 says that a listed person or entity may apply to the minister to have the listing revoke. The application must be in writing and set out the circumstances relied upon to justify the application. That's what it says. So a person or an entity, and I would imagine the CPP NPA is an entity according to the, um, yes, the definition of an entity in the act. Um, and with that, Peter, I think the minister here in Australia, um, whether it is the minister for immigration or minister for foreign affairs, they have a very wide power to do whatever they can. Um, as what one commentator said, they're like God, you know, God being given a power so they can do anything possible. And in the immigration law, and I would imagine here as well, you know, they have this very limited, um, you know, this um, primitive clauses where, you know, you cannot apply even to the court. And it's hard to challenge them on the judicial <laughs> review of the error in the law. So this would be a very uh, interesting and uh, um, really challenging <laughs> process, um, but it's really <laughs> worth doing it because it's, uh, you know, as what Peter says, it's a very political action and we will not only yeah. use uh, the, the legal um, strategy here, but also the, the political as well. Yeah, we have to campaign as well, you know, if Joma, if Joma would request, there has to be a campaign that goes with it. So uh, all um, you know, support organizations should do a campaign at the same time that Joma has lodged a request to be delisted. But my understanding is that there should be someone whom he will authorize here in Australia to file that request. That's my understanding. And also there is a question from Oliver. <laughs> A few questions. Oliver, yes. I, used, I, I was just wondering whether there's actually been any um, delisting applications made in Australia under the legislation, because it sounds like um, the legislation is relatively similar to, to, uh, uh, to that of New Zealand, which is what we've been looking at. Yeah. Yeah, look, I made an application um, many years ago, um, I think it was 2005 or 2006. Um, and uh, the, uh, the response was a very short letter it says, uh, we've considered your uh, uh, letter, we consider your application and uh, no. And so, uh, but I think it's uh, time to revisit. 
Before we uh, turn to both uh, Connie and I think yeah, Connie, yeah, Connie. Yes. Um, I, I just I just make one comment. Um, Joma asked uh, about the significance of um, not being listed under the uh, Home Affairs listing uh, as compared uh, to this listing. I think uh, that stems because this was a political decision. Um, I think uh, this, uh, and I think there was a recognition um, by the Australian government um, that uh, whatever um, the Philippine government and military said about the CPP MPA, the reality is that uh, at that stage, um, there was a, a peace process. There were concluded agreements, um, Cahill, um, the comprehensive uh, agreement on human rights and international humanitarian law was in place, um, so that there was that there was a, a, a quality of difference between um, the place of the CPP MPA um, and the NDF, of course, uh, and JAMA, uh, and uh, organisations uh, like Al Qaeda and uh, um, later Islamic State, um, but. It's a political decision. Um, they didn't believe that they uh, they chose to use um, the one three seven three process um, because it also uh, involved uh, a less uh, clear, a less opaque kind of designation, um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and more focused on financial sanctions rather than uh, wider implications uh, for Australians. I have to say that um, people have been jailed under this process. Um, there are two Sri Lankans which were jailed a couple of years ago for uh, providing financial assistance to uh, the Tamil Tigers, the LTTE uh, uh, a period of, I think one person got a, a sentence of two years in jail um, and another person got an 18-month sentence. So, so maybe Jan uh, will take your comments and uh, information uh, from, from your experience in the European case. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to make a very practical comment relating to the question Connie asked uh, about the criteria for organisations. The criteria, I think, everywhere in the world are approximately the same. The practical difficulty, however, is that when you ask for delisting, uh, somebody has to stand up on behalf of the organization. And then, uh, for example, in the European court, we had a whole mm. discussion, not with uh, CPP, because as you know, at that time, CPP decided not to make a delisting request, because from a political point of view, it refused uh, to subject, to submit its legitimacy to uh, the assessment of the uh, European Court. Hmm? So that was a purely political decision to say we don't, as a, as a movement, as a party, as a uh, national democratic movement, we do not, and, and many other organizations have taken that stand, uh, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, etc., took the same stand, saying, we are not allowing a European court to decide on our legitimacy. But so Joma is, of course, a different, uh, uh, is anyhow a different uh, chapter. And I think the political assessment that is, of course, up to the uh, friends uh, in the Philippines to decide what, uh, what exactly they uh, want to do about uh, filing or not an application for the organization. But anyhow, there is a, there is a practical question which uh, we met uh, at for different organizations in the European Court of Justice, uh, because whenever somebody said, I represent, for example, the Kurdish uh, PKK, hmm, the Kurdish Workers' Party, then the whole discussion started on, uh, uh, do you really represent the Kurdish uh, uh, Workers' Party? And what is the evidence that you are the person representing the Kurdish Workers' Party? So at some point, that was really a problem, and you might have the same uh, discussion if uh, uh, CPP decides uh, this on this occasion to um, uh, to apply for uh, delisting. That is one. Two, um, I think it's very, very important what Jason said about the mechanism. Actually, uh, the UN resolution only does one thing. It 
forces or it, it uh, decides that states should establish a mechanism to uh, freeze funds of people who are involved in terrorist activity. And there is also um, related to the funds freezing, there are also travel limitations, etc. So the, the, the UN resolution only does one thing, it says to states you have to set up a mechanism. And that's what, of course, uh, states did and what also the European Union did, um, uh, saying we have an obligation to set up such a mechanism. But next, and that's, I think, important to keep in mind, the decisions taken by that mechanism and the process through which those deci decisions are taken are the sole responsibility of the states or the entities like the European Union who set it up. Uh, there is no legitimation in the resolution. There is no legitimacy in the resolution for one or another particular type of mechanism. And so there are many different mechanisms uh, set up also throughout Europe, because of course we have this double layer situation where national states have member states of the European Union have their own mechanism. And on top of that, there is the uh, mechanism of the European listing, which might be different. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind, the responsibility of the mechanism and the fact whether such the, the question whether such a mechanism is yes or no uh, in compliance with um, basic uh, and substantive uh, rights is, uh, I think, uh, um, a very important question because you can't challenge that on a UN level. You can't challenge the listing on a UN level. Uh, it's actually analyzing and challenging the mechanism on a national level or a supranational level, like in the EU, which I think is uh, necessary. It's true that the, EU, that the EU from the very beginning had a much more, and, and Jason explained it, much more elaborate mechanism uh, uh, also with the definition of what is to be considered as terrorism, which is also in the common position and in the regulation uh, that are parallel. And I won't go into that because a very difficult, complicated mechanism with different legal uh, instruments for European groups and other legal instruments for uh, non-European groups. But that is, of course, of no uh, interest, no direct interest here. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think the European court actually uh, at the time, there is a double, there is, as you, as Jason explained, a double trigger mechanism. You can only get on the European list if a national authority, not necessarily of an EU country, uh, but if a national authority either prosecuted you or uh, uh, made an investigation, or if there was a conviction by court uh, uh, for a terrorist act. Now, what is important is to that. The European Court of Justice in the beginning had, a, and at the time when we pleaded the case of uh, Joma, had a very broad uh, interpretation of what was a national a, 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 a decision by a competent national authority. And for example, there were discussions on a EU listing, an OFAC listing uh, in the in US. OFAC listing is that a national competent authority in Great Britain, where the mechanism was also, um, I would say, almost exclusively a political mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a discussion in the European Court where the decision of the Home Secretary was a competent, was a decision by a competent national authority, yes or no. And I think what is interesting there is that the European Court, in the beginning, very timidly, but then more and more, uh, uh, took more and more uh, uh, importance in the in the next uh, decisions said that it can only be an authority national authority can only be a competent authority and this can only be a basis for listing in the eu if there is a judicial review of this decision if a judicial review of the decision is possible and so they attached more and more importance to that criterion because they said if a judicial review is not possible then we have a problem because then this is a, is, is a decision which actually is not in line with fundamental rights because it's a decision that imposes uh, negative, uh, that has negative effects for, a, for an individual. 
It's not a penalty in the criminal sense of the word, but it, it, it is a decision with negative impact on the person. And therefore, it should be, in order to be in line with fundamental rights as um, enshrined in the European uh, Human Rights Convention, in the Charter of the European Union, Fundamental Rights Charter of the Euro European Union, in general principles of, uh, of law, but as far as Australia or New Zealand is concerned, as enshrined in the two covenants of the, um, of the United Nations, the two United Nations covenants, it can only be, that kind of decision can only be acceptable if there is a judicial review, because if not, it is in violation of uh, these uh, fundamental procedural rights and other uh, uh, rights. And I think maybe that is something you should think about, try to mm -hmm. build that parallel and to see what you can do with that in the Australian and New Zealand context, where judicial review seems to be more limited or more... Uh, uh, so I think there is maybe a, a point to challenge. Now, let's be clear, it's always a political decision. Eh? It's political decision, the listing either actually from two points of view, it's a political decision because it is by, by definition an an, an a decision of the executive, which means that it is a political decision. It's not a judicial decision. It's not a decision of, judi of the judiciary. It is a decision of the executive. Uh, and uh, I, don't, I know that the traditions on uh, judicial control over decisions of the executive when those decisions uh, have negative effects, negative impact on, or, or, or on the rights, or have an impact, positive or negative, on the rights of an individual. I know the traditions on how far judicial review goes are very different from one country to another. Hmm? Uh, in many European countries, there is actually a tradition of a rather strong judicial uh, control over executive decisions in as far as those executive decisions do impact on individual rights, on, on the rights of individuals uh, in, in some way. Uh, but I, I think it's a matter of trying to see how you can use whatever uh, 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 your own system says about the necessity of some kind of control uh, over arbitrariness, uh, uh, some kind of judicial control to avoid arbitrariness and the necessity of, of that. I think it's building on that, which, which probably opens you uh, uh, a perspective. It's, of course, also political decisions in the other sense of the word. Uh, uh, we uh, were able to um, somehow rebuild the circumstances in which JOMA was listed. Uh, which were very clear. Colin Powell went to the uh, Philippines. Uh, then uh, Joma was listed uh, in, the U in the US first, a few days later. Uh, then Colin Powell, I think he came to Europe, or at least there was a communication with Europe. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and uh, then um, he, uh, two, a few days later, was listed in Holland. Uh, and then Holland actually submitted, Holland where he, where he is residing, uh, and then um, Holland submitted that to the European uh, Council. Um, and so that's the way he, he got into the European Council. And we also know that when the court delisted him, the European Council also has, has the possibility to relist somebody huh? because the European co Court owned cancels decisions from the past. And actually, in Joma's case, that happened once because he was delisted and immediately relisted on the same grounds. Right? And we had to challenge it a second time. And so after the second decision of the European court delisting him, uh, we know that there was strong pressure on the other EU countries from Holland and from the United States to relist him a third time. Hmm? Uh, we know it because we read WikiLeaks. Uh, and the whole process was described in WikiLeaks. Huh? Um, we could follow it on WikiLeaks. Um, and actually, we, we, followed, we saw it later on WikiLeaks. Huh? Um, but then the European countries found it was enough huh? uh, that uh, two times uh, process uh, uh, was not... Uh, when they lost two times, that they had no... Um, there was no... Uh, 
uh, enthusiasm to lose it a third time. And so uh, the other European countries then said to the, to the, to the Dutch and to, and to the US behind the Dutch that it, it, it was enough, that enough was enough and that uh, they were not going to take this further. The last thing I would like to say about uh, the uh, case law of the European Court of uh, Justice is that at the time when we challenged JOMA's um, uh, inclusion, the court was very, very, very reluctant to look into the evidence because actually the court said the only thing we can look at is whether is not the factual elements behind. The only thing, because it's a, two, two, a double trigger mechanism, the only thing we can look at is whether there is this decision by a competent authority. And so we can only marginally look into the evidence as such, because that is up to the national authority. It's the national authority that should decide on the evidence. And if you want to challenge the evidence, you have to do that on the level, on the level of the national authority. In the meanwhile, uh, because the European court uh, saw more and more that the national processes were uh, flimsy and that uh, uh, the judicial control was uh, in the national processes was very often very, uh, uh, I would say, superficial. Uh, in the meanwhile, the European Court there has been a whole evolution where they, they go more and more into the evidence as such. Hmm? And the turning point there was when uh, the Iranian Mujahideen, uh, the French, uh, had an investigation. Um, and the Iranian Mujahideen convinced the European court that uh, at least the court should have a look at the criminal investigation file. There was a criminal investigation going on in France and that at least the court should have access to that file to have an idea whether this was a serious criminal investigation or just some fake thing. And the courts actually accepted that request and said, okay, we want to have access to that French file, not to assess the evidence, but to assess the seriousness of this uh, investigation, uh, whether it's uh, based on serious elements or whether it's just a, a, a fake investigation uh, in, into it. And the French refused that. The French said, no, you, you, we don't give you the file. You don't have the right to ask the file. And then the court got angry um, and said, uh, okay, but if you don't give us the file, then that means that we can't verify whether there is a real genuine investigation going on in France. And if we can't verify that, then uh, we can't do our job. And so we, uh, we will lift the um, uh, sanctions on the, uh, we annul the decisions of the, of the European Council uh, in relation to uh, the, um, uh, Mujahideen. And I think that is maybe a second point which I think might be interesting to, because of course the systems are different and you can't just copy one, uh, but I think it's a second thing, that is that I saw that in other uh, jurisdictions, that is that at some point when political authorities, ju non-judicial authorities, refuse judges to do their jobs, hmm, uh, put too many restraints on uh, what they give to the, to the judges in order to make a judicial review possible, then judges, I saw it in other countries in Europe on a national level, judges sometimes get angry hmm, and say, hey, uh, this is, uh, you, you, are, you are actually preventing us from doing our jobs and you are trying to create a situation in which you can go on with completely arbitrary decisions and we're not going to allow that. And so the European court, who in the beginning was very uh, uh, restrictive on its own jurisdiction over the case, and actually the decisions were logical huh? uh, at that time, uh, because they saw that the judicial review didn't work on a national level, gradually expanded their own uh, um, uh, jurisdiction and grabbed more questions, drew in more questions into the process, getting closer and closer to the uh, assessment of the actual evidence. And now the last case, uh, one of the last cases uh, in which they um, took a decision is a, a new case on PKK, on the Kurdish Workers' Party, where they actually assessed 
all the all the evidence they 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 there are all all over Europe there are cases against PKK uh, for uh, in the, in Germany and France etc and and the court and basically in the process the court almost ignored the, those cases and said what is the evidence you are you are uh, bringing us huh? uh, so that case is now going on but you can feel through the process that because they felt restrained in uh, their control over the political decisions, uh, because they felt that the states were trying to keep these decisions to themselves and keep uh, a possibility to take completely arbitrary decisions, both on a national level and on the European level, you feel that courts get angry and say, no, this is not, a, this is not an effective judicial review and this is not an effective mechanism to protect uh, fundamental rights. Uh, so we will take over and look into the evidence. And I think maybe there is some inspiration there for a process in uh, uh, Australia or New Zealand to try to push the courts as far as possible into that direction and saying, we need a, 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 an effective mechanism uh, of review. Uh, we need, an, that mechanism cannot be the person uh, who actually took the decision, uh, uh, just uh, taking a new decision on uh, or reviewing its own decision. Uh, there needs to be a, a, a judicial or a kind of judicial review. If you don't have that, then these are arbitrary decisions affecting the rights of individuals and therefore uh, uh, not acceptable under the, uh, uh, amongst others, under the rights enshrined in the uh, uh, UN covenants. So. That were the uh, few remarks I wanted to make, and, and I think the two less, the few lessons we can draw from the process as it developed in Europe. Thank you, Jan. That's very, very helpful. Ravi, have you got any comments or any rejoinder? My my comment would be if if the minister will make a decision. Because I think that's what the judicial, the, the sort of jurisprudence of judicial review here in Australia, if that um, um, decision in writing is a decision. If it is a decision, the High Court of Australia has got an original jurisdiction under Section 75 of the Constitution. So that's one avenue. The other avenue is the federal court. Um, Merits review, the act doesn't say any merits review there. So there's no possibility of any tribunal, you know, reviewing the process. And I think as far as it is political, I think the, the pure logic of the law, an error of law will have to be race or jurisdictional error as what we call it here in Australia. So there it is. I think that's the, that's the um, avenue which I, I think that you know Janis <laughs> has given us um, you know some really good uh, good comments and feedback. So thanks thanks for that, Jan. I agree. I, th I think um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think that uh, Ray V, there's a couple of um, recent cases where the High Court of Australia, or in the last few years, the High Court of Australia has mm -hmm. been pushing back um, somewhat in, the, yeah. in a sort of sense. Um, that um, uh, that uh, Jan talked about the European Court of Justice pushing back um, and and frustrated uh, that uh, yeah uh, well we'll leave it at that I think that there there has been some movement in the High Court of Australia in that direction but uh, still uh, still it's a challenge um, yeah Oliver you have uh, a comment I, or I just wanted to ask Jan if, if he thought that those those concerns that the court had with arbitrary decisions as they related to an individual, if the application was made for um, an entity, so the CPP instead of an uh, individual, uh, whether, whether that changes your assessment or, or you think the court would have treated it differently? Oh, I don't think the court would have treated it uh, differently. Of course, uh, fundamental rights of an individual are... Uh... I would say easier to uh, invoke and easier to develop than the rights of an entity, but um, still, uh, it enshrines on the uh, it it it, in, in, it uh, infringes on the rights of uh, uh, on the freedom of association, on the right to uh, 
So, so there are also a series of rights uh, which um, entities can invoke. Now, and I think, for example, I gave you the, the example of the Mujahideen uh, uh, of Iran, which was a case on an entity, not on a not on an individual. And that, of course, the criminal investigation is always on individuals uh, or was on individuals because uh, most of, in most cases, uh, there are no criminal investigations into entities because the Mujahideen, they don't have legal personality, of course, huh? or the CPP or whatever. Uh, these organizations don't have legal personality in Europe. So uh, uh, from that point of view, it's... Um, it's uh, uh, criminal investigation against such entities is uh, in general not possible. Um, but no, I, I don't think that would make uh, actually the decisions on the Mujahideen, the PKK, etc. show that the court doesn't distinguish between those uh, two. You articulate the fundamental rights differently, that's clear, but... Uh... Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Robert, Any other Robert. Yeah, Robert. Uh, um, yeah. E either now or certainly just before you look at your timing of what you're going to do, because uh, we don't want to disrupt the Australian conversation. Um, uh, we could just give about a couple of minutes about where we are at, because timing wise, it might help you. But either now or yeah, close to the to the end. Uh, no, I think this is a good point because um, uh, to, uh, of the time, uh, and then I'd, I'd uh, put um, a suggestion or proposal of uh, how we could move forward in Australia. Yeah, um, and and uh, Cam might be able, if I've got anything wrong, or um, uh, Cam can uh, correct me on this. But in New, in New Zealand, uh, the main act that we're looking at is the Suppression of Terrorism Act. Um, and under that act, um, not, uh, there's been no listing of JOMA, uh, but the um, CPP, CPP slash uh, NPA has been listed mm. in 2010 um, and uh, for three years, and it was relisted 2013, 2016, 2019. And it's coming up for relisting um, in September, late September 2022, which is only about four months away. So for timing for us, um, if we're going to do this, what we thought we would do would be in a couple, um, by late July or very early August, um, under our um, Suppression of Terrorism Act, uh, Section 34, enables a um, third party uh, to raise with the prime minister. So our, our administrator over this is not the foreign affairs minister, but the prime minister and the prime minister in association with the attorney general. That's how the New Zealand um, law works. Um, but it can only be raised either by the organizations themselves if they're in the country or by a third party, but really only if that third party has, and the word they use is interests that are beyond those of an ordinary member of the public. We are thinking that it could be me um, as global chair of Friends, um, and um, uh, probably we need to, we'll be talking to friends about that. Um, but it does give us an opportunity that probably is uh, someone with an interest that is slightly more than a member of the public uh, in that. Um, so uh, then we would make our case. Um, uh, the, um, all of those listings uh, have been gazetted, but like what Peter said, um, and as each year goes on, very, fairly much the same as the year before, but they'll just add some about five or six rubbish um, uh, incidents, which have sort of been reported in Manila papers to say that um, the, the terrorism is still continuing from the, uh, from the side of the NPA. Um, we, I guess our expectation is, um, so with that is an administrative thing we'll do. So we'll put that in. Um, uh, the expectation is that it will be rejected pretty much. Um, 
there is an expectation also that, it, but when September the 28th or 26th, whenever it is, comes up, at least it will have to make the government work harder to relist because they will have had a whole lot of evidence as to why um, there should be uh, delisting. And in fact, what is likely to happen is we probably won't even get an answer to that until after a relisting if it takes place. Then, of course, if that if it, there is relisting again, then we come to those points that um, Jan has made and we'll be um, very, uh, we'll do our own work to, to look at how that can be reviewed, uh, whether it's a high court or other judicial review. Um, and, uh, but, but um, uh, yes, there was no, um, there was no process in New Zealand of any case being taken or uh, any court determining that uh, this was, or any of the groups that are listed in that very long list um, were listed mm -hmm. as, as terrorist uh, entities. So that's where, where, where we are at. I'm um, thinking we might, um, of course, we'd clear it with um, the parties concerned, <laughs> um, uh, but if, if that's agreeable, we'll do that quite quickly. Um, and then, of course, that that also has a, a, a perhaps a, a bearing on what uh, on what will um, happen in Australia as well. Thank you very much, um, and thank you all uh, for your uh, contributions. Um, so, uh, Peter, may I just. Uh... Yeah, talk about uh, another thing which is related as well. So we are campaigning and uh, having a petition to the Australian uh, Federal uh, Parliament to um, support the peace talks between the National Democratic Front of the Philippines and uh, the government. Because uh, those entities actually and uh, personalities, uh, and that's Joma, they're involved in that peace talk. So um, really, uh, we, we have to, you know, somehow uh, have a campaign that goes with the delisting. Because if you don't have that, uh, people actually, uh, especially, of course, the government, um, will have no uh, clue why we are having them delisted. Yeah, we want to show that they have a very big role in the peace talks and what's the basis of the peace talks. You know, we have the CASER, the Comprehensive Agreement on Socioeconomic Reform and others. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to somehow have a campaign around this uh, apart from the, uh, you know, the legal challenge that we will do because without this campaign, you know, we, we, we will just be, um, oh, it's not just just, uh, we, we will be, we'll be all just uh, look at the legal challenge, but really we have to look at the bigger picture in terms of the whole, um, yeah, the whole uh, goal of where we're bringing this, um, you know, this whole discourse. And it's, it's really about, you know, the uh, social change in the Philippines and the role of these entities, the CPP, NPA, um, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, JOMA, and others who are listed under the Philippine government's uh, listing as well. But that, that's how we will do it. And of course, uh, coupled with the um, STOP, Australian Military Aid to the Government of the Philippines, which will be obviously have to be strengthened because of the Marcos uh, Jr. and Sara Duterte tandem. Thank you, Jane. Um, my proposal um, to, to move forward in Australia starts with, uh, as Jane suggested, uh, this campaign is a broader campaign. Um, the campaign is focused on um, the legitimacy uh, not only of uh, the peace process and the way that the, the NDFP has participated in that and the concluded agreements, um, but also the legitimacy of the national democratic struggle. Um, so that is the beginning point. 
Um, the legal um, steps that we'll take um, is important. It's within that campaign, um, but it is also besides um, the process of uh, promoting um, the peace talks and the peace process as a legitimate process. So that includes um, a petition to parliament, but also a wider education um, process um, directed uh, at the general public, as well as uh, specific members of parliament. Next Saturday, we have a federal election. Um, we don't know what the result will be. Um, we hope that the uh, uh, there will be a new government uh, and we hope that um, that new government will see a new Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade who um, will uh, hopefully be more open. Um, and I think related to the timeline that uh, Robert suggested, I think we have to strike while the iron's hot if we get a new government. If we don't get a new government, it's probably we need to do the same thing very quickly. But uh, uh, certainly if we have a new government, uh, this is a time uh, to um, really um, advance quickly um, in the next few months. Um, so the legal aspect, I think, is to, um, to have JOMA ask for uh, the minister to set out the reasons for the listing and the relisting. Um, so a written request, um, we, I can and Ray V and maybe Jason can assist. We can um, draft, draft a, yeah. a letter for JOMA to consider uh, and sign. Um, my reading of the legislation, the regulation, uh, it, it doesn't say that uh, a third party can claim an interest uh, JOMA has to make that application. Um, Ray V and I can discuss whether or not uh, JOMA can uh, authorise a representative uh, mm. uh, to uh, be the contact point for the minister, but uh, that's a separate sort of administrative point. Uh, then the second thing is uh, we would uh, um, make a formal request under Section 17 of the Act uh, for a uh, delisting um, and um, yeah uh, uh, so that'll be a further drafting process um, and uh, uh, but uh, I'd, I'd certainly see that that uh, would uh, need to be within the context of uh, uh, the uh, uh, the context of uh, the wider campaign. Um, uh, I think that uh, there are members of parliament and hopefully uh, after the election, more members of parliament uh, who would be open uh, uh, to uh, make representations on them, themselves, uh, being aware of uh, the application uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to the minister to consider that. So that uh, is section 17. So it's section two is simple. The, the application must be in writing and set up the circumstances to justify the application. So it's uh, quite straightforward and simple um, uh, as a legal process. Um, I think we, uh, as Jan um, correctly pointed out, we are looking at uh, issues of fundamental rights um, and the application of those fundamental rights um, against arbitrary decision making. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see if uh, legally uh, options are open up uh, to, uh, uh, to challenge this uh, uh, negative decision in court, but maybe the combination of a really good campaign um, and uh, a well-crafted application based on what we know of uh, the previous reasons used by the minister to justify um, the, uh, uh, the listing of JOMA um, can have a positive result. Uh, yes, but uh, my, may I suggest that there should be a team 
Uh, and may I suggest that Sister Pat be included? She, she has a law degree, actually, Sister Pat. Maybe it's Sorry, time for you to. Well. <laughs> You're a lawyer. Sister, Sister Pat is a, is a lawyer. So uh, you have to. You have to Once renew upon a time. your license, huh? <laughs> Once upon a time. Once upon a time. I know, but you can, you know, you can be part of. Jane, just team. to, sorry to interrupt. Just to, um, in conjunction with the what Robert has said, the the um, uh, releasing of uh, Joma and the CPP here in Australia is actually will cease on the 17th of September, 2022, this year. Exactly. exactly. That's why we have to. It will, it will cease, and then they will reconsider it. Yeah. So yeah. It's a good timing that we need to. It's a good timing. In... Yeah. We should make sure yeah. that they will be Before delisted. September. Yeah. Hmm. It's good timing, though. I'd also point out that um, uh, my understanding under the legislation is uh, there's no specific time. The only thing that the legislation says is if you've made an application, you can't, and it's been yeah. rejected, you can't. To yeah, make a new yeah, application yeah. within yeah. 12 months, but after yeah. 12 months, you can so yeah. we can make an application at any time. Yeah. Oh, Gan is already going in a few minutes, he said. No okay. Problem. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Very yes, unfortunately, you. I have another Jan. commitment, so I'm sorry to, uh, but I'm, you, I'm always available Thank for, you. for through email or through, uh, sorry, please don't hesitate. Yeah. Uh, we really appreciate yeah. you taking the time, Jan, and uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. oh, thank you very much. You learned a lot. Yeah, yes, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I might. Um, I mean, I think we're close to wrapping up. I've made some points. Um, I've uh, noted uh, Jane's suggestion that Sister Pat join us, and uh, uh, we would uh, very much yeah. value her contribution. She's always a person who speaks with. Oh, I have also another suggestion. Could you please explore if we need to have one uh, one of you or someone to represent Joma? That you know, but somehow he has to authorize that person. Because I know, well, I have a little bit of practice with uh, immigration law as I'm an uh, immigration mm -hmm. advisor. So, um, yeah, you, you always need, you know, representation, especially if you are not here. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, yeah, I propose yeah. that uh, one of the uh, paragraphs or sentences in the letter to the minister is uh, I am a drama could decide to say I authorize a person. Yes, um, and that's we'll right. That's who that mm -hmm. person is um, uh, to be my representative uh, to receive co communication and co correspondence uh, on my behalf. Um, so that uh, yeah, hopefully things will be quicker than uh, being sent to Netherlands and then waiting for it to be coming back to us, kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Would Peter? Would that be you? It could be me, but let's let's have a let's have a conversation about it. But uh, yeah, it could be me. Yeah, in my private capacity yeah. rather than my regulated capacity. Um, just technically, can you send me the recording so I can share it with Joma so he knows the whole what we have discussed. He yes. can listen to it <clears throat> and he will understand why he's being asked to to write the request yep. or he, he's, he will ask, you will draft it and he will sign it. So if you can send yes. me the recording. Well, yes. I expect you will review and uh, he can make proposals uh, to improve it. So Peter, once you, you know, you yeah. uh, don't, don't push the leave uh, right away. Uh, so you have to sort of uh, exit all of us. Then you, <laughs> I just seem to have to give instruction to Peter so that it will be recorded properly. Then <laughs> you will you'll be the be the last last one to leave because you've given co-host to uh, you know to Jason. Make sure you'll be the last to push the leave yes. and then wait for it to be downloaded. Okay. Uh, and uh, on the computer, not on the cloud. Yes. For security. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right, right, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate, fortunate to have um, such a um, very competent tech person. <laughs> we have to learn. <laughs> we have the cyber attack nowadays. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, my focus right. is on the law of modern technology, but anyway. Yeah. That's all right. So thank you, everyone. Um, and, thank you. Uh, I'll draw the meeting to a close, and uh, yeah, pleasure. I thank will you. set you later. Nice short night. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lou and Conley. Bye-bye. Sir, Jason. Cameron. I didn't see Cameron's face. Okay. Can we push the leave? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can leave now, but Peter, don't leave yet. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ah, Peter. Yeah? I will send you an address. I'll send you an address. Okay. Where you can send the recording. I'll send it to you right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sige. Tapos mag-leave ka na. Yeah. Okay. What about this record? Oh, well, uh, mag, uh, uh, mag, uh, mag stop the recording ka. Then ma-sandali. Uh, Teka. End. So end muna. And then end all meeting. Pwede na eh. Oh. Oh.